So any questions before I begin? <laughs> no? Oh, OK. All right. Let's see here. So this is my directory of stuff. You've come to my death, basically. I have gathered everything if I was supposed to die tomorrow in one place. Because there's this thing called the internet, which I don't really have time to like put stuff on. Uh, for the majority of my life, I've always worked alone. Um, I, only, I didn't know that people had teams of people that do things for them. <laughs> so uh, for the majority of my career, I made everything. I, I wrote all the books. I designed all the books. I did the color separations for the books. I wrote all the code for everything. So it wasn't that great it was in hindsight. It was a little mess, but it was my mess. And I made a lot of it. And so I'll walk you through that. Does that sound OK? And I'll get through as much as I can. Uh, I'll do my best. So here we go. So if there is a central theme, I'll have to keep these computers awake. If at the central theme, I love this fortune cookies saying. It reads, the great pleasure in life is doing what people say you cannot do. And this was not a Chinese philosopher. I found the reference. It's a European philosopher. But I think this is kind of what I want to believe in. And I think creative people tend to skew that way. How many of you like ascribe to this philosophy? You've got to like it a little bit, right? Yeah, because it's like, you can't do that. And like, yeah, I can. Um, because you're kind of stupid. <laughs> because you really can't do it. But sometimes you like make it. It's a kind of audacity. And so I guess I've always believed in that. Now, in terms of like one of my most prized possessions today, uh, last year, the artist Oliver Jeffers dipped me, which means like he did a, like an like a oil portrait of me. And then we had a private six-person ceremony where he dipped the painting so you can no longer see it anymore. So kind of like modern Snapchat or something like that. But <laughs> His whole point was that uh, nothing is permanent. Everything keeps changing. And if there's anything I believe strongly in, that's so true. So much of what you will see is really irrelevant and stuff that was relevant when it happened, but not anymore, in a sense. And I'll take you through that. OK. So. Um, Let's see. Uh, if there's a general theme that interests me, it's leadership today. Less more so about making. How many of you lead teams? Lead teams, right? So when you lead teams, it's actually uh, much worse than making things. <laughs> Have you noticed this? Um, it's, it's a little harder. And so much of my later career was discovering leadership and finding how interesting it is if you take it as a creative endeavor. So. Um, long story short, that's where I ended up. But where I began was I was just making things. Like in 1989, I made Man Penguin Dog. <laughs> it, was the color pillar, it was the color picker of choice. To select my RGB, I would just move man, penguin, or dog around, and I would know my, R my RGB value. And I made it in X windows at the time. Um, also, uh, I had just come from a world of a uh, very ancient world of tofu making. My parents made tofu for a living um, in the International District in Seattle. And I guess if I look back on why I believe in, in learning, it's because I came from nowhere. My parents had no education, uh, they had no money, but they had this belief that somehow the American dream existed. And I guess we were fooled a bit in a good way. And we bought into it. And as an accident, uh, it all happened. Um, and I think about that a lot because I believe in empowering others. Because I've been empowered so many times. Like, how many times did like, a person change your life? Raise your hand. Come on. Who had that person, right? And they weren't like trying to be nice to you or something. Oftentimes, they were just trying to do what they thought was the right thing. I know that I would never have gotten to MIT if it wasn't for my chemistry teacher, Mr. Wakefield, in 11th grade. He thought I had promise, but I was so clueless because my family didn't know how to go to college. And uh, he said I would never get to MIT if I didn't go to a uh, summer class at the local college. And uh, who grew up in a family business? Family business, right? You don't work. You don't, 
you have to work during the summer. So my first reaction was, nope, can't do that. And so what happened is um, uh, Mr. Wakefield uh, went to visit my parents at the store and said, if you want your kid to go to college, he's got to do this. And when I look back, he didn't have to do that. But I think those kind of things I keep, I hold dear to me. And I always ask, what can we do? What can I do on any given day to try to nudge things in that direction? Now, um, I used to make, so I was lucky to have gone to MIT and defected to art school uh, in a classical Bauhaus style art school outside of Tokyo. And that's where I discovered that metal is really hard. Um, metal is really hard. I spent like three months uh, making this out of a chunk of aluminum. Now I know you can like laser cut it and 3D print it. I think like I think I got such worse RSI because of this thing. I keep this like on my on my desk to remind me how I lost part of my arms in that thing. Um, but just to make every make the curves, make it shiny out of a block of aluminum, it's terrible, terrible experience but lovely because it reminded me that the physical world is so much harder, literally, than the virtual world. Now, um, I also had the fortune of having a good teacher, a set of teachers, classical design professors who told me that I should do things that were relevant to the age that I was in because I preferred to do typography, like classical typography. You know, I want to be like Eric Gale, I had the whole thing. Um, but my teachers all said, go do something young with yourself. So I went back to the computers and began making things. And it was important because the problem with someone who, like, who's an engineer by training here? Engineer? The problem with engineering is that you make stuff all the time, but you aren't sure what to make. And so what's nice about being in art school is I knew what I wanted to make, and suddenly I could use my engineering skills to make it. So I made things like this in PostScript. Uh, there was no high resolution means to make things, uh, so PostScript was away. It was actually quite cumbersome. I'd have to write the code and go to an image setter to get an output. So it was, a, it, was a labor, it was more like a printmaker process in a way. And I made all kinds of things in this era that I never published, but so again, this is stuff that as if I were to die tomorrow, you'd like, oh, I think I remember something like that. Um, this is my experiment. Um, <laughs> Some of these experiments make no sense, like in hindsight. Um, this was like, I wanted to make an image where I drew circle, triangle, square, you know, the vocabulary of modern design. And I wanted to like get rid of every pixel at, at a high resolution. So I made this gigantic print where I drew it as many times to make no, no like blank pixel gap. Now, the problem when I made this is that people thought it was like a magic art thing. They were like, when I squint, I don't see anything. I don't see like a flamingo. And I was like, no, that's not the point, you know? So anyways, I did things like this. Uh, I drew a lot to create. Uh, I, I, I would think in code and just uh, make the code and just experiment. And this was a series of things that are on called design machines, <laughs> where I was trying to play with just graphics in every shape or form. I was exploding serifs, just trying stuff out, you know? Um, and I was lucky to have a Next computer, which had display PostScript, which made it easier to process. Thank you, Adobe. Um, I also began to make things that I, that I don't fully understand, but help me understand things. Because when we make things, we learn things. And so over here, let me show you what that is. Let's see if it still works. Okay, let's see, was it three over here? That's three, that's one over here. Okay, so I'm going to try this, and I'm not going to guarantee it's going to work. And the battery, how many? Ooh, okay, let's see. This is the fourth battery I bought. Um, they all die. So let's see what happens. So that was the first. Oh, this is one. Let's see if it happens. Let's see. Oh, my gosh. What happened? Whoa. That worked. This was the first thing I made of the category. Um, I wanted to make something that responded. I was interested in pushing against the idea of interactive graphics. I wanted to make reactive graphics. This is in 1992, I think. And I was making these things react, and I wanted to like, make a language. And so I made this thing, uh, kind of like, you know, like a carnival, where you can like, hit the thing, and it like, pops up. And it'll determine the different, uh, uh, you know, you hit the thing, and it goes up. So, so this is like measuring that color. And I think if I do this, 
It's like one gigantic reactive pixel. Now, when I made this, people were like, what the heck is this? I was like, I'm not sure what it is. But I thought it was interesting, you know? And so I made this is Rectographic 1. And the reason why it looks like this is because Lion King was really big. I know it makes no sense, but it was, it was like a moment where like brown, jaggy, something like that. Um, then this was, I haven't run this in so long. This is a Rectographic 2. This one also, I don't understand, but this one, I wanted to make a, it's a tapestry of interaction where each sort of subgroup has interactivity in it. And I think if I wait seven seconds, it takes over the whole screen. So, oh, there it is. I used to play with cursor graphics. So this is basically every subprogram executing on the entire frame, field of view. And I wanted to make something just super hyper reactive. And so this kind of programs the canvas to react to a different area. So this area becomes that uh, experience. And so I was imagining how to make canvases of experience. And so if you'll see, if it counts down three, two, one, uh, this area is more dominant of experience, and this area is more dominant of experience. But the rest sort of uh, uh, pick up that kind of like sub, uh, that subcategory experience. Okay, let's see how do you quit? Whoa, sorry about that. How do I change the volume on a Macintosh? Here we go. <laughs> Sound. Okay, output. Hmm, let's try that. Let's go around there. That's good enough. That's good. I have some sound later you'll want. Or actually, I want. So um, that's the third one, second one. Oh, I haven't made this one. That third one didn't make. Oh, I the fourth one, the fourth one made more sense to people because it looked like, work, like regular work. And so all of my professors said, oh, this is actually much better than everything you made before because it looks like, <laughs> it looks like Johannes Itten or something like that. And so, uh, they stopped, like, worrying about me. Um, but, uh, yeah, this one, I don't, that one, I don't know. So uh, this one was the fifth one. This one, how did this one work? This one, again, I was just really interested in, like, whole entire fields of color. So it's like one giant pixel experience based on color. Again, nowadays on the web, this is all very normal. Uh, this one was playing with shapes, and I was just very interested in how things change color and how different like ge ge geometric shapes sort of change your perception of things. And again, when I was making these things, there was no internet. And when people would see this, they weren't sure what it was because it didn't do anything. Um, yeah, so that's uh, the rack to graphics. Um, and then from there, what happened was I began to make like a variety of things. Well, let's go back over here. OK, so are you following me? OK. If it gets boring, stop me. OK, that's Rectographic 5. I also made uh, another thing with video that no longer works. Uh, I showed it in London a long time ago, but there's so much stuff like it out there now. So it's a thing. Um, this one, oh, that one, does that one work? Oh, yeah, it's one of my favorite ones. Uh, so let's go over here. I haven't like, seen all these things in so long. Um, this is called the Color Typewriter. Sorry about that. So this is like a hello, hello, I am right here. Can you see me? Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> so it obeys ascenders and descenders. And in my, in my point was that, you know, also it's like you can like mouse over it if you're like vision impaired. So you can like look at the pixels and read it like this, read it big. There's an idea in there. Um, uh, it was all part of a series of things I made to question how the, how the computer worked. Because at the time, ah, Photoshop was such a big deal. And uh, I wasn't sure whether Photoshop was the big deal or the person. So I made this as a kind of a satire piece where I wanted to ask, <laughs> like, who's really in control? Is it you or is it the computer? Which actually in the... Machine intelligence age has like certain kind of uh, meaning. Um, I was also curious about the axis that lives on the screen. Um, I was influenced by how uh, Moholy Naji saw space time. And I made this piece called Time Paint. 
Uh, and this is, uh, this is made with a lot of love to fake all this interface graphics. Uh, but I wanted to show how the space of the screen is actually uh, multidimensional, whereas we think of it as just running in 2D, but it's always running in ND, really, you know? So I made this uh, to sort of prove a point. Um, and then I made this one, which stopped me because I got lost. I wondered what happened if the screen wasn't rectangular. Like, what if it was like done in polar coordinates? So I made radial paint, which proved to be completely useless. <laughs> um, you know, I can draw a rabbit. I used to be able to draw a rabbit. Well, anyways, you know what I mean? If I just move x, y, it moves around the circle, and I move up and down uh, r theta. So you know, I was just trying to make things that kind of like question how the computer became came to be. Um, and then, right here. And then what I began to do is just try to understand things. Um, I kept sort of creating things to understand them. This is what I try, I, this is an artificial, this is, a, this is an ink simulation that I made. Um, it ran in Japanese, but let's go over here. It ran in Japanese, so it'll, it won't display correctly, but let's see here, dun, 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 is that the one? Ooh, I haven't used this in so long. Uh, so I was interested in talking about graphics. And if you think about this graphic here, do you see how there's like they're blue? And I can draw in magenta. This is like cyan, magenta, yellow, et cetera. Um, what I wanted to do is I wanted to make it so that you could program the ink to do different things. Like I could tell the, anything that's blue move right. So you see it moving right. Uh, anything that's magenta, I can tell it to move even faster, actually. Time now. Uh, at. And so the point of this was I wanted to show two things. The first thing is that when you create things on the computer, you have to remember that print was a dominant mode of thinking. So this kind of thinking was quite foreign. So I wanted to show two things. The first thing is that you can create things that last in t equals forever, which are odd to create. The second thing is you can make things where x and y are infinite. So the pink rectangles went off the screen. But as you know, they're, they're going to keep going. We just don't see them. And so I wanted to talk about how the screen is not the screen we see, but it's a canvas that is really kind of an alien material. And that's why I made this. And again, I would make these things, and I, when I look back, how much of my life did I waste on this? But um, <laughs> I would make them, and they'd be useless. Um, OK, that we get that. And then, though, what happened was I had the, I kept making things that are like physical things. Like I kept like taking all my hardware and like changing it, kind of customizing it. So like removing the, the symbols on everything. Um, and that would inspire me to make things like this where I made this because I changed my keyboard. This is like this, because I imagine the keyboard as a kind of a tactile element. Uh, so I would like take things and see what they were and try to translate them to this medium. And a lot of things would, a lot of things would occur, like this thing I remember. This thing I made because I wanted to have something that retained momentum. So if I do this, it keeps like spinning. That, you see that? Or it like slows down and you know, like this. And if I do this, it keeps decimating to even lower, 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 lower. You see that? And eventually I can ask you for all your money. Um, <laughs> you see that? So interesting, because you, you can't do this on paper, but you can do it on screen. And that's what really fascinated me. So I made all these things just to kind of like, I guess understand. Um, this is one of my favorite ones. This is one called one pixel. It's called single pixel. It doesn't really do much at all. Um, so if I move, it's like a flea circus almost. So it just kind of goes back to its place. It's very calming. Um, that's one pixel. So going over here. Um, so keyboard. 
Um, and then I had the fortune of meeting Mr. Anami, who was my producer. Check time. My producer, uh, who discovered me. And he said, this stuff, I want to sell it somehow. I was like, really? You can sell this? And he says, yeah, we're going to sell it. And then so he commissioned a book that I designed. I designed a book in print um, that came with a floppy disk. It was called the Reactive Square. And what it is, it's like 10 squares that respond to sound. And it's a book. It's like a, it's like a book. It's a real book with die-cut pages. It was very expensive to produce. Uh, produced uh, 2,000 of them. And um, like very few sold. Uh, say so it was a failure as a commercial idea. Um, but it, be, it was critically interesting to people. Um, I think, I forgot, like some people started to collect it and like talk about it. And again, there was no internet because they only had floppy disks at the time. Um, and I'm just getting something set up here. I just made a video. Where is the video? Oh, hi, it's my daughter. Um, Let's see here. Where's my video of the thing? Oh, my daughter wants my car now. Um, they always want my car. Uh, let's see. Where's the video? We're going to make the sound here. I could hear that. Okay. So, over here. Over here. Keep this one awake. Okay. So, made the reactive square. And the reactive square responds to sound. And it's, it just does this. Ah. Like that. And um, I did this because at the time, Apple shipped microphones. And no one knew what to do with them. And they put them in their desks. And I thought, wow, maybe it could be something. So I made these 10 squares. And there's 10 squares, and they all do different things. They basically display sound. Um, um, like that. And they just, just have different sort of flavors of like motion change. But I made it while listening to this. Let's see, this is a complex digital thing to do. OK, let's try this out. Oh, interesting. I made this while listening to this. It's this is my friend, uh, Nishimatsu Fue. So this thing likes her. idea. So that was Reactive Square. And um, I remember now how it was interesting to make this because I remember one of my, the daughter who wants my car right now. She's like 28 years old. So she wants my car right now. And um, uh, she was the one who, when she saw this all the time in my house, I remember like visiting like a computer shop. And she would go up to the computers and go like, ah, <laughs> ah, like this. Because she's like, why doesn't it do anything? <laughs> but I thought that was interesting, that when you change the norms of people, you change the expectations. You know, we know that when you touch screens, they're supposed to swipe. So anyways, uh, well, the norms are important to change. And this was an idea at the time. Um, and from there, uh, because it was a, the first one was a failure, uh, I made a second one. Uh, and this one did better. Uh, this is called Flying Letters. And this came with a, an accordion print, uh, four color, uh, three color, actually, um, little book. And uh, it just takes Helvetica and just plays with it. This is like ticklish type. <laughs> like that, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's kind of cathartic. And I just made compositions like this. Um, this is like, you know, positive, negative. You know, like simple ideas like this. Um, and I just play with this idea uh, of like a marionette. 
And it was interesting because you would see people use it, and they're like, oh my gosh, it's moving. It's because your hand is moving. So uh, people expected interact interactive things, but these are more reactive. They're more like animals would respond to you. Um, and you know, this was a time when this kind of stuff was hard to create. I made this all in, in, with integer mathematics to increase the performance, um, which nowadays is like, what is that? But um, all these were basically exercises in optimization um, uh, without showing anything that seemed mathematical. This is like illumination. And this is uh, letters that go to heaven or letters that go to the earth. That's flying letters. Uh, and that one did better. Um, and so then Mr. Nami commissioned this set, 12 o'clocks. And this wasn't a screensaver, but it was an exercise in making clocks. Uh, again, I wanted to use integer math to sort of show uh, what you could do, which at the time, this kind of graphic fluidity was not so common. The internet hadn't sort of made it sort of a thing where everyone could see everything all at once. And it was a fun era just to kind of make things like this. So I just made all kinds of things like this. And I remember like uh, I would be inspired by seeing uh, children play, my children's play. So this, is the, this comes from like, you know, going to the swings. And like, woo, you know, it's like back and forth, back and forth. And these, I made, I wrote C code for a series of phones in Japan that integrated these ideas. I don't know what happened to that phone. But anyways, um, this is like a little clock and a big clock like that. Um, and this is like from 20 years ago. How weird. That. This is kind of a, a Rodchenko inspired clock. Anyway, so things like that I used to make. Okay, and then um, what happened is I went to MIT. And when I went to MIT, I began to uh, change, I guess. This is 12 o'clock. So it was a CD. That was a big deal. Uh, mini CD, no floppy disk. It was so much easier to design with a CD than a floppy disk. And everything I made, I would just make by just writing. I have uh, all these like sketchbooks that I used to use to just sort of create and sort of take everything apart and just code it. And just try to make things to help me see. And I would also do commercial projects. This was for Shiseido. It's a cosmetic company in Japan. Um, uh, this is basically, uh, I would hide things that I couldn't get away with copyright. So this is like uh, 40 years of Shiseido commercials, hidden in kind of like a marble, <laughs> marble pattern. I think it was illegal. But anyways, uh, I'd make things like this that looked kind of exotic, but it had a kind of secret, I guess, a data story behind them. Um, and when I left Japan in 1996, I had a bunch of exhibitions like this where I would show laptops and show different things I made in print. And it was a really great year, 1996. I was making all these things. Um, and then I was invited to come to MIT to be a professor there. And I'll never forget how um, I was always making things. Like, who loves making things? Come on, raise your hand. I'll make it. Make, isn't it great? Make stuff. Nobody like messes with you. It's good. People get out of your way. A little scared of you. you just make stuff, right? So, anyways, um, I knew nothing about politics in 1996. Organizational politics. Do you know what I'm talking about? If you don't know, you'll find out soon. Thank you. Heavy nod. Um, I. Um, uh, I, I remember talking to someone, and someone said, you're going to go to MIT? There's so much politics there. I said, really? What's that? So the person who hired me, uh, Whitman Richards, uh, said to me, like, you know, ah, can't wait to have you on board, Joan. And I said, I heard there's politics at MIT. Is that true? It's not at all. 
I said, okay. So I arrived. And then a week after I arrived, he was pushed out of the top. And then they hired two people. And then the other person they hired, they canceled. So like I was there, and the person who hired me was gone. Bad situation, right? Who's been in that situation before? Come on. Right? Stranded, stranded, yeah. That's how I became a survivor, though, right? <laughs> So I went all over MIT camp because I had no research funding. So I'd find old computers and just like find stuff and like cobble stuff together. And I had a really great research team uh, that really kind of was, that was really passionate about this idea that computation uh, and art and design would somehow come together. Which you have to know that at the time it was like a really a foreign idea. Um, I went to a, a dinner in New York in the 90s, and I sat down, and you know, when these like art things, whatever, you know, I'm sitting down, and we're introducing ourselves, and then like, who are you? You know, I'm Bill, whatever. Who are you? I'm Jane, whatever. Oh, I'm John. Might someone says, I hate you. <laughs> and I said, Why do you hate me? You think that computers and this art stuff somehow will come together? And I was like, Wow, you hate me. Uh, but it was a common thing. You know, people didn't think that they should ever come together, and even today, it's a little complex. But uh, in the 90s, I got to meet so many people who believed to the contrary. And I just kept making things. Um, I never liked professors because they always take the student's work. So I built a kind of a Batman practice. So at night, I would do my own stuff. And by day, I would enable what they could make. And uh, I don't regret that because it enabled uh, people like Ben Fry and Casey Rees and Golan Levin, people like, I'm like, how, how are you doing this stuff? Uh, so I'm really glad. Um, so my work after that point didn't get much better as a reality. Um, and I realized that I had to hang up my mouse because I couldn't like compete anymore. So as the last thing I made, um, it was this piece called 12, uh, called Tap Type Write. And I made this as the last piece I would make because I knew like whatever I made wouldn't, wouldn't, matter, wouldn't matter anymore. So uh, this is tap type right. I want to make something in completely monochrome, you know, just black and white, no grays. Uh, all integer math, so as fast as it could be at the time. And um, uh, it was inspired by a, a, a story of my mother. My mother was a secretary. And she could type really fast. And you know, when you're a kid, you admire your parents. You know, you want to like, you know, show your parents you can do good stuff too. So I, I trained to be a, a faster typist. And then I remembered like I'd practice and practice and practice so much. And then I remembered like in high school, my typing teacher, I, I hit 120 because my mom can type 120. So I said, ah. and my teacher like hugged me. It was a little awkward, but I was like, yes. And I came home and said, Mom, I can type 120 just like you. My mom laughed and said, I can only type 80, actually. <laughs> so I always keep that in mind. So anyways, here's this piece, and this is shift. And there's like 10 variations. This is like spin the plate. Like a ring of type. This is like happy type. This is like flowers. This is uh, when I was a kid. My favorite uh, film was a French film, Red Balloon. So this is a theme that. Peaceful. <laughs> yes, that's good. This is about balance. If you hit G, it's all okay. So that's top type right. And I made those kind of things. I stopped making them. I knew that the world had changed. 
Um, I, I had the fortune of working with really great, uh, I really can't call them students. They're amazing artists and designers and researchers. And they would just make things that I didn't fully understand. This is Ben Fry. I recruited him out of this little company called Netscape at the time. He could have been rich. But anyways, uh, <laughs> um, he started making things like this. This is a way to kind of visualize a website being tracked. Uh, this is the later work he did to visualize word networks. And if you've seen the work of Ben Fry, it just keeps getting more and more interesting. Um, and in the 90s, I was a pretty harsh critic to all the work. Um, and I had this really funny uh, student, uh, Peter Cho. Um, uh, I think Steve Jobs called him twice to try to recruit him. So he's a very talented person. After, after he left, he was amazing. But I sent him this like kind of harsh, um, uh, critical email. And because he's kind of funny, he wrote, he made a visualization of the email. So I'll show you that. It's kind of interesting. There we go. He's a little sassy. And this is a time when there were no tools to make this kind of rendering happen. So these were all custom. I stopped bugging him after this. <laughs> uh, so anyways, it was a kind of an era of making things. Um, and I did a few things at the time. I did like things like this, just to kind of experiment on the side. Um, I did move to Java at the time in the mid-90s. I made a lot of things in Java, uh, where I tried to bring these ideas that I began here um, into the internet. But quite frankly, Flash just took off. And everything got so amazing that I thought, ah, oh, OK, time to stop. But I made things like this just as my kind of fun to see what I could do by just writing simple pieces of Java and see what I could make with it. Now, um, but then over here, let's go over here. Switch to Pism over here. It's what over here? OK, oh, stay awake. Um, so after making this kind of work, I began wondering if I could keep making things on it. Eventually, I realized that I ran out of things to imagine uh, because there was so much amazing work coming out. Um, uh, I tried to make things like this, I remember. This was like, um, I was trying to sell tools to people. Uh, this was like a way to kind of sell to an ad agency a visualization tool for like type animation. So what it is, it's just basically playing it. And I was really interested in like, uh, like this fine control of information, uh, controlling of the, of the time spacing. And so these, these are things I kind of was interested in doing for a while. Um, but I realized that uh, the whole world was moving so quickly that I had to get out of the way. And so what I did, uh -huh. there we go. So, I did is I began wondering how to teach computation because I, I thought that learning how to make things in code was hard. Uh, it had gotten really hard. Who remembers the original C language? C language people? Oh, old time. So um, if you remember the first version of C or the first sort of edition of C reference language, it was just this thick. It was like super thin and it was learnable. But after that point, it became like this, 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 you know, to like 7,000 links later. So it was kind of impossible to learn. So I made this kind of system to teach how, I made design by numbers to teach computation to more people. And it, bless you. And when I look back, I, I'm glad I did that because I didn't do a good job at it. Um, so I did this. Let's see if this still works. 
Okay, let me remember how to do this. So I made this, um, and design by numbers. Who knows about design by numbers? Any like uh, anyone? Yeah, it, it died. Yeah, you remember? So, um, so design by numbers. I had this idea that I want to make a super constrained computer programming language. So, uh, and I wrote a book in twenty chapters, and this is like the first command paper. So, and all numbers in design by numbers go from zero to one hundred because I thought that made more sense than 0 to 255. Anyway, so if you say paper 100 and you run it, it's 100% black rectangle. If you do paper 50, it's a gray rectangle. If you do paper 0, it's a white rectangle. That's chapter 1. <laughs> chapter 1 is a really good chapter. Um, and chapter 2 was a little more complex, because now you choose the paper now you want to draw something with the paper, right? You want to draw. So you have to get a pen. And so like let's say I want a black pen. Paper zero, pen 100. White paper, black pen. Um, so now when I run the program, it's kind of fun. Because you look at it and like, nothing happened. But that's the thing. Something did happen. The computer got its pen ready to go. It just hasn't done anything. And that's the whole point of chapter two. It's that something can happen in the computer that you cannot see. And that's what makes it a strange medium. And then chapter three is about drawing lines, which gets easier. It's like two points on a line. And what I discovered over time is that uh, people could draw anything with just these constructs. And then chapter four, I introduced variables. Oh, so I can say like line A0, A100, set A250. And the idea of a, of a variable feels a bit like a remote control because you can just change one point and you change every place in the program. And the reason why I want to do this was to set up the fact that if you do, if you can loop, if you can repeat the variable, you can then uh, iterate, as you all know. <laughs> And you know, for most people, drawing 100 lines is uh, tiresome. But as you know, the computer never gets tired. Um, you can tell the computer to, to just set the pen to A, and it, it does that, right? Um, draw a gradient in the same way. You can tell the computer to uh, change the paper each cycle, and you have an animation. So I created this to kind of help understand how it all works. Um, it also supported like network interactions and mouse input, et cetera. Anyways, I made this, and uh, Ben and Casey, who worked with me on my team, thought this system was like, like it didn't do anything. So it had to be more useful. It should have color. It should, it should draw in a span larger than 100 by 100. I said, no way. It's got to stay in 100 by 100. Uh, said, no, no, it's got to get bigger. It's got to have color. No, it's got to be like black and white. Uh, anyway, so uh, uh, they made a system called processing, which was great because I kept telling them, don't do that. You should work on your other stuff. And they made it. And because of that incident, I never trust anything I say. <laughs> um, I don't trust anything anyone tells me also because you just don't know. So anyways, this is my number is like, was born and it quickly died. Uh, but it was a way to kind of start to see uh, how programming feels if you feel it's creative. So if there's one contribution I'm proud of, the play button still lives on. Um, anyways, I began to make things for different people. Uh, I would just make images because I was curious about them, but never really had any time because I got busy. Um, and I made one networked art thing. Uh, I made it I had this idea where I wanted to collect line input from all over the world, like a, a drawn line. 
and I want to get enough line input to go around the Earth. Turns out the Earth is really big. Uh, and also, this is before people used all this stuff. You know, it was kind of like weird. Um, so, anyways, I made like the world largest line, and I printed it in Japan. Um, and that was kind of interesting for me, at least. Um, but then I got interested in fire. Um, I was curious about the physical world. I also became disillusioned with a lot of things at the time. Um, I think in this era, I think having 9-11 occur sort of re-kind of like jiggered all I thought was important and began living in the physical world. And I would make things, I went back to my aluminum block. I made things out of plastic, wood, etc. Just to kind of like find materiality again. Um, but over time, um, I also got interested in money. Uh, and I changed my research team's direction towards uh, commerce. And so this is something you probably never saw. Uh, it was in use by the, the number of users was 112 uh, because there was no mass usage of these kinds of network-based systems. Uh, this was a system to sell artwork online. And I became interested in money because I was afraid of money. Because people would always tell me that I'm the creative person, so don't worry about the money. So I began studying economics. I got my MBA as a hobby. And just got curious about, like, what is this money thing? How does it work? And, you know, how does it work? So uh, then I also began just sort of making things a little more free. So this is a series. Um, I began playing with scanners. So this is a bag of Cheetos. And I scanned two bags of Cheetos. This is before Cheetos like, have all these variations, like sour cream Cheetos, whatever. It's like a regular Cheetos, sorry. Um, and I began scanning things and making things out of them. Um, I had a show in uh, Chelsea, and it was basically, this was called uh, Butterfries. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's butterflies made out of Cheetos. <laughs> The, uh, you know, like that. There's, and these are the little potato chip crumbs on the edges and a pretzel body. Uh, I made that. I also scanned McDonald's fries. And this is called Amber Waves. <laughs> and uh, I made jello molds. And I began to reconfigure the colors in jello molds uh, computationally. Um, I also began playing with dried anchovies. Uh, I call this Lazarus. Get it? Dried anchovies brought back to life. Um, like an aquarium scene with dead anchovies. Um, I also began really interested in like Campbell's soup because of the whole Warhol thing. So let's see if this works. Okay, because this battery might not last. Go over here. Time. Okay. Questions out there? Questions? Okay. So let's see if this works. So this is the later era. Um, Command Shift Plus, I reminded myself. Okay. This was for a series of, uh, I'll show you some videos that don't exist anywhere online, but I had a show in Paris at the Fondation Cartier. I had a uh, uh, eight large projections, and I had a special room called I'm Hungry, uh, E-Y-E, apostrophe M, Hungry, because I wanted to show in a contemporary art gallery a place for kids to come and enjoy interactive art. And so these were a series of, let's see, six different uh, pieces for interaction. This is called Broccoli, of course. If you hit space, they all go off like that. It's kind of fun. Yeah, that's broccoli. Um, and um, uh, what was that one? Oh, I haven't seen this in so long. This one, I think it's the French fry, infinite, the infinite French fry. Yeah. So I can draw an infinite sizzling French fry. Again, I don't remember why I did this. Um, okay. Okay. And this one is... So I like 
went to Stop and Shop, like a supermarket chain, to get every possible Campbell soup can. And um, and what this is is it responds to sound. So ah, all the soup. <laughs> it was pretty powerful, right? So it's a good moment. Like ah, you feel like so powerful. I'm not sure why. Power. There we go. Anyways, stuff I made before. Okay, so wait, let me let me show you. Oh, let me show you. I have a some movies, films that I made. So let's go to number two. Number two is the middle one. So, so I have this thing that I made uh, in 2004-ish, where um, this was my desk. I wrote a special rendering system. Uh, in Python that would access, I had a network of like 10 Mac minis in my house. It was like a personal project to have my own render farm. And I wanted to see images I couldn't see in real time. And so I just like used to make all these little snippets of things. And then in Paris at the Cartier Foundation, I put them all together uh, into, into something. Um, and they're called nature because I wanted to express the nature of the computer. And and uh, it was an on-site thing. So just let me show you what they were like, because that might help you understand what that is. So this is linear way? Yeah. This one is, that one done? Yeah, that's good. All right. Let me show you, lin that was the second one. Let's try this thing called enter full screen. Yeah. There's no sound, so sorry. You can cough, it's OK. They're like little pieces. And I made them all using gestures. So there's no randomness in them. Um, and I wanted to make things that were hard to make at the time. So I did a lot of uh, blurring, because it was hard at the time. And I was just looking for like how the computer feels inside when you're creating code inside. Because most people don't know what it's like to write code. Uh, it's, it's unusual, the environment. It's not stable. It's not like a medium you're used to creating in. And so these are just made to express in a large room of uh, eight screens. And they just ran sort of in loops like this. But it took me like a year and a half to create all these snippets. I think I made around 180 different variations. Um, and they're all manual. So I just kept like moving things around. And as for why, I don't really remember why. I just thought I wanted to see, I wanted to see it, because I hadn't seen it before. Now when I go online, I'm like, oh my gosh, can you believe what's out there? It's like amazing. Um, but I just wanted to see things I couldn't, I wanted to see things I could feel inside the computer that were hard to express to someone who doesn't work in this medium, that it's a, a space of raw imagination. And after making the third one of these, I think I showed them in Europe somewhere, and someone said, oh my gosh, these are terrible. Um, and so what I did is I made one for that critic, actually. Um, it was called, his name was Mark. I called it responding to Mark. <laughs> there we go. Oh, yeah, hello, whatever. Um, this is responding to Mark. Dun, 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 dun. What was it? I don't remember. I was responding to Mark. Okay, I'm good on time. Everyone gets that on time. And this is after like three quarters of a year. I was looking for like a, kind of like a more softer means. And uh, I showed it to Mark, he wasn't impressed. But um, I, I enjoyed sort of like making these kinds of things. And so they're like, they're like four minutes each. Um, they're in the collection of the Cartier Foundation. And uh, I rendered them at like, I forgot, 843 by some other number. So anyways, uh, it was hard to make 
these kinds of things, which now we can all do in real time. So I'm always impressed by what we do today. Yeah, and they don't, they're not algorithmic. Uh, they're all done with manual input. Okay, and then where's my, I think my favorite one is high rise. Uh, yeah, I guess my favorite one. This is the, it's the most boring one, but let's end with this one. How about that? Okay, I'll just show the whole one. Let's pretend we're in Paris together. I'm a big fan of the movie Arrival. Maybe you figured it out.
So this is the last one I made in that series, and and it was a uh, it was a nice opening, and uh, nothing happens in these things. Uh, and I remember when it opened, uh, I was two shows. One show was a famous sculptor, just came from the Venice Biennale, and um, and. Uh, I remember like when I was getting set up, because I have no team, but just to show up and do stuff, make it, get it ready. I remember like the, the artist had like an agent, like an agent agent, like a Duke agent, like a royalty type agent. And I was like, whoa, you got a Duke. And the, having an agent meant that he didn't have to do anything. You know, he, the agent would do all the press, the agent set up his studio, agent paid for all his assistance. It was like amazing. And he never had to do any press. The agent took care of everything on, on his own. And quite frankly, I was jealous. I was like, whoa, that is such a really great thing. You mean, wow, you know, I was like, wow, that's really great, you know? He had all his exhibitions lined up. All the connections were there, and I was like, wow, this is amazing, you know? But anyways, the shows opened, and it was nice at a party. And at the party, I, I wanted to stay in touch with this artist. So his artist, his work is amazing. So I remember I like, went up to him and said, you know, I really love your work, it's amazing, um, love to stay in touch, and I gave him my business card. And then he took my business card, and he said, a business card. How slick of you. And I thought, whoa. <laughs> you know, I had this moment where I wasn't jealous anymore because he couldn't survive on his own. And I think in that sense, I believe in creative independence and the ability to make. And I hope that you all continue to make whatever you want to your way um, and be free. So we covered some stuff, showed you some stuff. Thanks for taking time. And have a great rest of your day. Good luck.